in India, God bless you. Those watching up in Maine, God bless you. We haven't gotten into a formal Bible study like a book. Probably won't do that till the first of the year. When the year turns around, then we'll get back to getting into a real good Bible study. Um, but we're going to get into a study tonight. And um, the question I want to ask you is, will all Israel be saved? There's a lot of talk about Israel on the news. I don't know if you've been following the news. Uh, they had over 300 missile strikes uh, last few days from Hamas. Um, that um, actually fell upon one of the dwelling places in Israel and killed a person who just happened to be Palestinian. Uh, he wasn't Israeli. He was a pa Palestinian working in Israel. And... Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what's going on? I've been doing some studying on the temple and the temple mount. And uh, there's different views of what's happening with the temple mount. Some believe it's still the, the, the Dome of the Rock there where the um, Muslim temple is. They believe that's the temple. And others are saying it's the city of David. And you say, well, what difference does it make? It makes a lot of difference. Uh, because one, if it's in the city of David, they can build it any time and without creating a World War III. If they do it on the Muslim temple, guess what? That means they have to bulldoze it down or it has to be rocketed down or something has to happen to that temple. It can be an earthquake, whatever. But um, my question to you tonight is, will all of Israel be saved? And I want some kickback. I want you to tell me what you think. Will all of Israel as a nation be saved. Okay, I got one no from Rebecca. I got another no from another no and another no. Bob Luce, you're shaking your head. What does that mean? No? Okay. Okay, not all Israel will be saved. But what do you do with the scripture? In Romans chapter 11, verse 20. Is that what, is that what, is that the one I got? Wait a minute, maybe I'm, uh, I'm sorry, 26. And so all Israel shall be saved so how does that equate to all of us saying no huh I'm asking you a question about the scripture it says and so all Israel shall be saved it didn't say part of Israel it said all Israel so what is your answer to those who would say to you, see, all Israel is saved, because the Bible says so, and so all Israel shall be saved. What is your answer to somebody, especially a Jew, a Jewish person? What is your answer to that person? When I would say the majority of everyone here said no. But that's not what the text says. <laughs> that's not what the text says, though. Okay? Oh, uh, well. Yeah, but aren't they part of the, the promise of Abraham? The covenant with Abraham? Before any works were done? That their right, their their belief in in what God was going to do was going to be uh, good enough for their righteousness. They're part of the Abrahamic covenant. Well, I can see from the look on your faces, I've got you thinking. 
But again, I want to stress to you tonight, when you read the Bible, that you read it in context. Look at verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. But there's a conditional clause there. If they abide not still in unbelief. What was the, what was the promise that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What was the promise? In thy seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Right? So the promise, the Abrahamic covenant promise, was that there would come a seed. Amen? Look at verse 21. It says, for if God spared not... The natural branches. Who's the natural branches? Israel. Right? God spared not the natural branches. Take heed lest he also spare not thee. So question, who is he talking to? Is he talking to unbelievers? No. He's talking to Christians. So if he's talking to Christians, he's saying, take heed lest he not spare not thee also. There's a teaching called replacement theology. And a lot of the churches today do not believe that Israel as a nation will be saved. Or the Jews will be, be saved uh, along with the Gentiles. They, they believe that the church that is now existing, the church is now replaced because of Israel's disobedience, the church has now replaced Israel. That's not true. God still is who he said he is, and his promises are still true to Abraham. But in a different fashion, if I can put it that way, in a different way, God's going to stay faithful to his promise, but in a different way than what was realized at the time when he made those revelations to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because understand that they only had limited knowledge at the time. They didn't have some of the things that they had. Uh, Jesus had not come yet, so there was still that promise and that wonder. Is, but yet they had faith to believe what God said. But the, the actual uh, event had not taken place called Calvary yet. So anyway. So if God spared not the natural branches... And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion, verse 26 again, the deliverer, and shall turn ungodliness from who? Who is Jacob? From Israel. So it's the deliverer that shall take away ungodliness from from Israel, if they still do not abide in unbelief. In unbelief of what? In unbelief that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Now go back for a moment. Go back to verse 30 in chapter 9. It says, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? Next verse. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not obtained to the law of righteousness. Why had they not attained it? Why had they not attained it? 
because they didn't believe that Jesus was their Messiah. See, for the Christian, for you and I, it's not our righteousness that God looks at. It's the same for Israel, but for us, he doesn't look at our righteousness because our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. But he looks at the imputed righteousness of Christ that we believe in and we appropriate to ourselves. I am made righteous because of Christ, not because of what I can do. Amen? Now, that doesn't mean we shuck off the responsibility of what we need to do. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to obtain the righteousness that we need to attain to. What was the reason why they had not attained it? Go to the next verse. Wherefore? Why? Because they sought it not by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. But as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Who was that? Their Messiah. He says, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now look at verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. The Apostle Paul says this. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. There's no guarantee. So how do we reconcile that with the scripture I read in verse 26 that says, All Israel shall be saved. Well, let's just go to verse 2 in chapter 10 there and keep going, 2, 3, 4, just to give you an idea. Uh, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, hath not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law. Not that the law ends. He is the, he is the fulfillment of the law. To everyone that is Jewish? No. To everyone that believeth. See, Jesus lived a life that was perfect. He lived his life according to the law of God. He obeyed in every dot and tittle of the law. Every part of the law he obeyed, and he was obedient unto death. And because of his obedience, hear me now, because of his obedience, we are made righteous. Because of what he's done. He's lived the entire... Not one of us can keep all the Ten Commandments. Because we have a fallen nature. Now, that doesn't give us an excuse to sin. That gives us a reason not to. Look what he says here. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Look at Galatians 2.16 for a moment. Galatians 2.16 for a moment. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Look at that wording. But by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith 
of Christ. Did Jesus have faith in God? Yes, he did. Of course he did. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we know that Jesus pleased God in every aspect of his life. So he had faith. We have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Does that include the Jews? Yes. I'm going to go back for a moment and look at Romans 3.20. If I can get these pages separated here. Three twenty says, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Amen. Then he goes on in Romans and he describes the method of justification by faith and not of the law and, you know, of righteousness and not by our own righteousness. But then he says this in verse 8 of chapter 10. He says, but what saith it? The word is near even into thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 9, that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shall be Saved. Look for a moment in chapter 9. In verse 3, Paul says this, he says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That was the Jews. And then he says this. Verse 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God bless forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God had taken of none effect. Look at what it says in verse 6. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Why is that? You remember the story of Esau and Jacob? Twins? What did God say about them? He said, Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. He wasn't talking about individuals there. He was talking about two nations. He says, there are two nations in thy womb. So Esau was of the Edomites, Edomites and of course Israel, Jacob was, of his, was Israel. And out of Israel came the 12 tribes. Are, we, are you following me now? He says, for they are not all Israel, which are Israel, neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, the purpose of God, according to the election or choice, might stand not of works, but of him that calls. Verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. 
So we see here that not all are the children of God simply because they're born in national Israel. Now they're part of the nation of Israel, but they're not children of God because it's of the promise. Amen? Look at chapter 11. In verse 1, he says, I say then, God hath cast away his people. God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What He ye not what the scripture says of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have, kindled thy pro they have killed thy prophets, dig down thy altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what did... What saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved of myself to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to the image of Baal. Verse 5. Even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That does not mean that they didn't have a, chance, they didn't have a choice at salvation. That's not what election means. Some people say some are elected to God to be saved, some are elected not to be saved. That's not true. Because then we have to change John 3.16. For God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten son that only the elect shall... Hello? No. It has nothing to do with salvation. It's not salvific. What nation did God choose? Out of all the nations of the world, which nation did God choose all the way back in Genesis? He chose Abraham, and out of Abraham came Isaac, and out of Isaac came Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what God chose. He chose them. He didn't choose the Philistines or the Hittites or the Parasites and all those other Hittites and all those other nations he didn't or Egypt or he didn't choose those nations he chose Israel what were they supposed to be a kingdom of priests a royal priesthood a holy nation he chose Israel it has nothing to do with salvation once saved always it had nothing to do with that it had to do with being saved by as a by being called that's what the word election means called as a nation God called them But he said, also, there is a remnant that God has. Now, Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Let me see where we're going here. Hold on one minute. I got it written down over here. Look at verse 8 of chapter 13. It says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Meaning they're going to worship the Antichrist. Anyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, hello, they're going to worship the Antichrist. But they're going to be those that are going to be saved through the tribulation period. And their names will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And they're the ones that are not going to 
um, give in to the Antichrist. In chapter 7, let's go to verse 1. Chapter 7, verse 1 of Revelation. Can we get that up on the screen, Revelation 7, verse 1? Thank you. He says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. Verse 2, please. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now stop there for a moment. Go, go back to verse 3 for a moment. <clears throat> Let me ask you this question. Who is the tribulation for? Who is the tribulation for? Israel. Right? It's known as the... I think it's in Jeremiah, says it's known as the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time that God is going to deal with Israel. Now remember in Romans it says that he's able to graft them in again. How's he going to graft them in? How's God going to graft Israel Back in. When you say towards him, towards who? No. You're almost there, Bob. You got almost, you're right on the teeter totter edge of that. That they're going through the tribulation. For the purpose of recognizing that Jesus is their Messiah. Now watch this. Next verse. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now let me say this. In the dispensation of grace we live in right now, there are many Jewish believers that are turning to Messiah. Because the question is asked, what do you mean, pastor? Is only going to be 144,000 of Israel, Israelites that are going to be saved? No. But during this particular aspect of dispensation, yes. God has a remnant. It's the same way with Christianity. I forget how many millions of believers there are around the world, but are they all believers? Is everybody a Christian just because they say they're a Christian? Or they go to church, to a denomination, and have an affiliation. Does that make them a Christian? No. Just like there's a remnant for Israel, there is also a remnant of believers, of Christians. Who are those remnant that are Christians? Out of all of Christianity, the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, I would say millions of Christians... How do you know those who are Christians? Talk to me. Born again? Yeah. But how do you know that they're Christians? By how they live their life. Jesus said it this way. You'll know them by their fruits.
He said, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many go in thereat. So it's going to be a minority, not a majority. Those who are going to pay the price, be ridiculed and mocked for their faith, and believe and stand for Jesus Christ, and are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, those are the ones who are true Christians. And the ones that are playing the game, skating the ice, you know, skating around, living like the world, doing things in the world, you know, going off into the world, and playing with, the, you know, playing with Satan's bait. And those that think they're saved, but they're not. They're like the, the versions of oil, that had oil and some of them ran out. But it says, they were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. That is the remnant. During this particular aspect of the dispensation that God's going to deal with Israel. Now, let me ask you this. Are these, is this remnant, these children of Israel, are they sealed by God because they're Israelites? Are they? Everyone's afraid to answer. <laughs> Are you afraid of me? <laughs> afraid of being wrong, right. That's what they're afraid of, afraid of being wrong. Are these sealed because they're Jewish? No. Mm -mm. How do we know that? Look at chapter 12. Verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, we all know who the woman was, right? Who's the woman? Say it louder. Israel. Sorry about all those people in churches that believe the woman is the church. The woman is not the church. First time you see the mention of the woman in the church in Revelation is chapter 12, where um, it says the woman, she had the, the sun and the moon and the stars, remember? And I told you the first principle of mention, when something's mentioned in Scripture, go back and look at it. Who was the sun and the moon and the stars in Genesis? Joseph. Remember when God told Joseph, the sun and the moon and the stars are going to bow, bow down and pay obeisance? That was his mother, his father, and his brother. Who's his father? Jacob. Israel. So we know the woman is Israel. Through proper interpretation. Not some speculate, speculated interpretation of, uh, I call it, eisegetical uh, input into the scripture to make it sound for the church so that people can say we're going through the tribulation. But look what it says. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. We just read of chapter 7. The remnant was the 144,000, right? 12,000 from each tribe. Which keep the commandments of God and what? Have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The remnant has the testimony of Jesus Christ. They are saved. They have the testimony of Yahshua, Hamashiach, the Messiah. Come on, somebody. Not because they belong to the nation of Israel but because they belong to Yahshua. They have the testimony of Yahshua. That was the remnant seed. So when you go back and you look in Romans again,
in 10, uh, 11, verse 26, says, and so all Israel shall be saved. Go back in chapter 9 and go back and read where it says, not all that I say there are Israel are of Israel. Not all of them are the children of God, but those that are born of the seed. The seed is Jesus Christ. Look at, look if you, let me see if I can just get it out of the top of my head here. I'm trying to think if it's in Galatians. I don't know where that is. I'll have to research that again. And so Israel shall be saved, as written, there shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. From Jacob. The deliverer being Jesus, the Messiah. They believing in Jesus, the Messiah. In fact, if you go back to Revelation, let me see where that is. I think it's in chapter 17. Let me see. Nope. Okay, here we go. It's, it's chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11 in Revelation, verse 1, and continuing. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. So we understand that the temple is going to be restored, be brought back to Israel. How many believe that? I believe that. Now, I've heard so many different testimonies, I've, I, and I know we've been to Israel, we talked to some Jewish people, and, and I do not believe that God's presence is going to dwell on the Ark of the Covenant again. Do you believe that? When the temple comes and the Ark is brought back and put into the temple, that God's spirit is going to dwell on that Ark? Why? Huh? Okay. Right. But we know that the, the blood of bulls and goats cannot make anyone justified, cannot save anybody. But they're going to believe that. They're going to believe and animal sacrifices, and I know if you're an animal lover, you're not going to like that too much. But And understand, during the Old Testament times, there was times when they were killing 120,000 goats all at one time, 30,000 sheep. Oh, yeah, it was, it was a bloodbath. But they didn't waste that either. They ate it. It's not something like they just tore the carcasses away. They had a burnt offering. But they're going to instill that again. They're going to have the temple. They're going to have the outer court with, for the Gentiles. They're going to have the, the brazen altar. They're going to have the, the bowl to wash in. They're going to have all of the utensils and everything back, the, the table of showbread, the, candle, the, the candlestick, and all of that. They're going to have all of that. They're going to have the priestly garments. They're going to have the red heifer. They're going to have all of that. It's already, already being planned out and staged out. It's already done. All they need is the temple. And of course, you know that there's controversy about the temple, where, it's, where the actual temple was. Now, I've been doing some research on that and studying it, and there's arguments for both, both that are really, really good. 
Some say the city of David. Some say Mount Moriah, you know, where the, the mosque is. There's, but there's arguments, strong arguments on both. So I'm kind of like still investigating, still so. I was kind of leading toward the city of David, but I don't know. I have to go back and research some of the historians like Josephus and those to find out what was actually there because the other view of, of Mount Moriah is a very strong argument except for this one question that's not being asked. If that's true, then where was Fort Antonio that the Roman gods were in? There was over 10,000 in that fort. Where around there could they house 10,000 soldiers? Or, or 6,000 soldiers, 4,000 to maintain it? So that's a question I don't see people asking, and that's the question that I would ask. And they have a little tiny building that they say was there, but there's no way you could put 10,000 people in there. So there's a big to do about that. But all of these things are going to take place. The temple's going to be restored, but they're going to believe that that's their way of forgiving of their sins. But out of that nation of Israel, there is going to be the remnant, the 12, 144,000, that have the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of their Messiah. Now, I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase this. Okay? Um, go, to the, go to the next verse. Let me just read a couple more verses here. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city that they tread under the foot 42 months. Three and a half years. Next. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, that's three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. Go ahead. These are the two olive trees, and we understand the olive trees are, are na the nation of Israel, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Next verse. And if the man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies, and if any man hurt them, he must in this manner also be killed. So God's got a protection on those two prophets. Now, some believe that that's Elijah and Enoch, or Enoch and Moses, or Elijah and Moses. We're not, they're not sure. But these two prophets are coming to Israel, and they're going to do, I mean, think about that. If people come against them, fire's going to come out of there, they're going to die. They're going to have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain. They're going to have power to call down plagues upon the earth. And people are going to see all of this stuff going on. And in the midst of all of this, there's the Antichrist is going to be manifested he's going to be doing his thing okay and the bible says and all the world shall be deceived by him except those whose names were written in the lamb's book of life so we see the jews here getting saved the 144,000 that are here on the earth going through this tribulation period go to the next verse these have power to shut up the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Wow. I mean, you and I would probably sit here saying, well, if I saw that, I'd believe. Mm, maybe not. Understand one thing. When all this is going on, the church at large is already in heaven. Going through the Bema Seat of Christ, Amen? Waiting for the millennial kingdom to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. All of that's going to take place. So we're not here as a church. We're in heaven already. The Bible says, until he that letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, meaning the restraining power of the Holy Spirit. You understand that God has a, the, the bad, real wicked angels, the real fallen angels. He's reserved in chains right now. But they're going to be loosed. I believe they're going to be loosed at the moment the church is raptured. That restraining power that's taken out of, the, out of the world, the church up in heaven is going to unleash that kind of wickedness on the earth. And the Bible says that any man whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're going to be deceived by the Antichrist. 
Even today, I heard on the radio. Was it on the radio? Yeah, I believe it was on the radio. I heard uh, they were saying that uh, there's businesses now that are starting to mandate their employees to have a chip in their hand to access the building. I saw in the news the other day, this is on the news, on television, that uh, they're saying that it was on the Jewish news. They said that the, uh, one, uh, the United Nations are planning for a one-world government within 12 years. That's their goal, within 12 years. So if that's the case, they're going to need a leader for one world. Any idea who that might be? <laughs> Obama. <laughs> you might not be too far off. Okay. Next verse. Huh? Not the Antichrist. The Antichrist. Okay, next verse. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. This is all because God is allowing it. Remember, anyone that would come against them, fire comes out of their mouth and they fall dead. How come not now? Because God is allowing it for a purpose. For a purpose. Next verse. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, which is where also our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. So here you're going to have two prophets prophesying to the Jewish nation. And they're going to rise up and... The beast is going to rise up and he's going to kill both of them. And they're going to, their bodies will be in the streets of Jerusalem. Laying there. So what are they going to do? Bury them? No. They're going to leave them there. Next verse. Their dead bodies shall lie in the streets. No, nope, you had it right. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, which also our Lord was crucified. Now, next verse. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. What they're going to do now is they're going to mock the death of these prophets. These prophets, these are the ones, they're dead. You listen to their words, they're dead. Now, how many people will be undermined by, their, by that action? How many people are really going to say, you know what? I don't care if they're dead. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to stand with God. And understand now, we're under grace, and now we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But then it's going to be different. So their bodies will be in the streets for three days and a half. They're going to be ridiculed and mocked. And it's going to be almost like their Christmas. Next verse. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, shall send gifts to one another. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. But then something happens. What? Next verse. And after three, three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. I'd be afraid too. I mean, because understand this now. There's, this was not possible 50 years ago. 60 years ago. But because of satellite television and the technology today, iPhones, iPads, I could take you to third world countries and they have phones. They have Wi-Fi. 
maybe not all the families, but a center will have it, a, a church will have it, or a, or, or, or a place of business will have it, or the government will have it, and they can broadcast it so that the, everyone can see. Verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven. Hear this now. Even after all of this, and they're hearing a voice from heaven, they're still not going to believe. A great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Wow. Then God's going to come back. Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back to establish the millennial kingdom on earth. He's coming back for the thousand year millennial reign. And then the new Jerusalem is going to come down. And then God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth therein where dwelleth righteousness, he says. So see, this world should not be that attractive to you. The things of this world shouldn't be so attractive to you because we have a better place that we're heading toward. Don't be deceived in thinking that you're missing out on anything that the world has to offer. You're not missing out in, on anything. There are greater things yet to come. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered the heart and the mind of man. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. Come on, somebody. God has prepared some things for you and for me, hallelujah, that if we stay steadfast, unmovable, unshakable, in the faith, God will see us through. He will bring us to that point in eternity with him. So now, are all Israel saved? No. Not as a nation. They won't be saved. There's going to be those that are going to be damned. Amen. There's going to be those Jews who refuse Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's not a club that you join because you have a promise card. He says, if they remain still not in unbelief, he's able to graft them in again. And that's why it's so important for you and I to pray for Israel, to pray for the nation of Israel. He said, I'll bless those that bless thee, and I'll curse those that curse thee. Why? Because Israel is in the plan of God for the end times. Israel is, is, is in the plan for God for you and I. Because Christ is coming back with his saints. That's us. We're going to come back with him. Some of us may be flying. I don't know. Some of us may be riding on white horses. I don't know. I don't know how it's all going to unfold. But I know we're coming back with him. And he's going to rule and reign forever and ever. The devil is a liar. The spirit of Antichrist is a liar. The beast is a liar. This world system is a lying system. And they're going to come in and they're going to try to whitewash it like it's no big deal. Just take the mark. If you want your retirement money, if you want your disability money, if you want to get your paycheck at the end of the, at the, end of the week, you're going to have to take the mark. Hopefully, by that time, we'll be gone. I don't know where in the stage of that it's going to happen. I know it's the pre-tribulation, but the first three and a half years is going to be peace. And watch Israel, because that's the one you need to look at. Because when the Antichrist comes on scene, he's going to make a peace agreement with them. And then after the three and a half years, the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke about, 
when, you, when he stands in the holy place, but in order to stand in the holy place, the temple has to be built. And I'm telling you, they're saying that they can, they can erect this temple in no time. Think about that. Even if it took a, six months or a year, if they started building that temple, you better look up for your redemption draws nigh. Amen. That's not the time to take chances. Now's the time. Now, behold, is the day of salvation. Now is the time to stop fooling around and, and to dedicate your life to Jesus Christ. We are living in the last days. I know you've heard it since the day you went saved, but I don't care. The imminent return of Christ is imminent. He is coming back. And you have to ask yourself the question, is wanting this life and choosing this life and doing what you know is wrong worth it? Your eternal salvation, is it worth it? Notice that those testimonies, the ones that gave the testimony of Jesus Christ in Revelation, it says this also, they obeyed the commandments of God. 1 John talks to the Christian. It says, if anyone say he loves him and obey not his commandments, he is lying and the truth is not in him. So there has to be that desire to want to serve God, that desire to want to allow the sanctification process to work in your life. And the holiness and righteousness, for without holiness no man shall see the Lord. So there has to be that desire in your heart. There's a desire for God and the things. Come on, I'm talking, am I talking to the walls here? I'm talking to you and I'm talking to myself too. We need to increase our desire for him because we're living in the last days. Amen? Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. And we thank you that Israel is still a part of your divine plan. You said, Father, for us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, Father, for that peace, but we understand and know that that peace will only come as they receive the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Father, we pray that you will open the eyes of those that are getting saved now, and we know that out of the tribes of Israel that you have 144,000 that are still going to come out during the tribulation period. But Father, we see the door to the Gentiles closing slowly. Years ago, we would tell somebody about Jesus and they would get saved. We saw an influx into your church years ago when people would go out and share the gospel. People were getting saved and turning their lives over to Christ. And great moves of God in 78. But now it's getting worse and hotter and worse and harder to lead them to Jesus. People don't want it anymore. They want a form of godliness, but they want to deny that power. They want a Christianity that is made up of their own way, doing their own thing, not submitting to the cross, not dying daily, they want a Christianity that's convenient. They want a cross without commitment. They want a cross without, without self-denial. They want an affiliation, not an identification. Lord, we pray for Israel tonight. Lord, we know your hand is upon Israel because Israel needs to be alive and real and functioning so that your prophetic word that you have decreed many years ago will come to pass. So, Lord, save Israel. Save those that are going to come. Lord, you already know. But as that happens, the door to the Gentiles slowly closes. The time is ticking. How hot it's going to be for our loved ones to remain behind, to be left behind, to go through this time of devastation that the world has never, ever seen. The tribulation period where the suffering of humanity 
and the outpouring of your wrath, justified, of course, being poured out upon this earth such as never before. Earthquakes, famines, pestilence. They're going to be crying that the rocks would fall on them and they would die and they won't be able to. Your judgment is coming, but it must first begin in the house of God. Lord, help us to live a life that's pleasing to you, to put aside everything and put you first. You said those who will not deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Help us to do that, Lord. Your grace can enable us to do that. And so, Father, we thank you tonight. And we thank you for Israel. And we pray keep Israel safe. Lord, reveal all of the hidden schemes and war plans of the enemy that want to wipe Israel out. Stop Iran and Hamas and Al-Qaeda and those in the extreme jihad that want to destroy Israel. Reveal their hidden plans to Israel and to the leaders. And let your archangel Michael protect Israel until that time comes, Lord for Jacob's trouble to begin. Now, Father, keep us and help us to know that the serious times in which we live. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen and amen.